Hello everyone, today we talk about Thessalian cavalry. As you know, one of the most famous and appreciated and well-deservedly so cavalries of essentially mm, classical but especially Hellenistic warfare, um, as we know, um, that of course owes much of its um, uh, importance also for the role that it had in the Alexandrine armies mm, uh, as uh, actually since the times of Philip II and eventually in the army of Alexander III, Alexander the Great, um, uh, covered a very important tactical role um, as we will see now as basically the, the, the finest elements of horsemen maybe to, together with in terms of actual horsemanship, uh, right? The, the tactical role was likely different. Of course, com the companion um, cavalry of the Macedonian kings were kind of delete in this regard, but we'll see now how the same the provincial definition of Thessaly is uh, corresponding to a, a much more segmented uh, m military um, than than we often think of, like. You know, we, we have this wargamistic approach to the the Salian cavalrymen as this guy, as we will see now, the, the, you know, the existent and then the uh, the Boeotian element and kind of unarmored. But the, the difference is um, is a bit is a bit wider, right? When we th think about the Salian cavalry, of course, in Thessaly it was the same, the very same segmentation of the troops you could find in mass, uh, and and we can start from this. In fact, stressing. Um, the, the nature of Thessaly in itself. Thessaly was very like Macedon, uh, only part urbanized, dominated by the nobles and their excellent cavalry, hmm, with traditions of unity, but usually divided. And, and these areas had, especially in the coastal plains uh, of, on the Aegean Sea, had um, allowed in these flatlands the and in their in pastures to uh, to levy very good horses as well. This was not just, of course, it's a uh, complementary uh, horsemanship tradition together also with good horse breeds. Think about Bucephalus, we will talk about him uh, later on. Um, uh, that, however, it corresponds to, to this broad er broader area. Naturally, Macedon is more important, historically speaking. Thessaly was uh, you know, a respectable force in its own regard, but never was uh, this dramatic power of uh, of regional scale at all um and but but there are great similarities also in this world there's a bit borderline now here what is Hellenic and what is not for example is a subject is a susceptible of debate think about the i don't know the Athenians that considered the Boeotians in the north kind of barely uh, barely uh, Greek uh, uh, as such, and you know you can imagine these other populations of the north, the Thessalians, the Macedonians, the Paeonians, that technically you know were heavily Hellenized um, uh, and were in part, in fact, the same uh, people in, but also mixed with other other Thracolian elements, um, were were considered as, as something different. These were essentially feudal societies, at least they are called like these uh, a bit more and uh, as you know um, feudal societies are what produces um, fine cavalry good heavy cavalry and that's the reason why essentially in the rest of sedentary Europe right sedentarized Europe there wasn't actually any feudal cavalry the the, the Greeks themselves didn't develop any proper the, the Romans didn't the Celts, the, the Barons, the, nobody did actually. Um, but there were these influences um, in the area, especially coming from the the northeast of Scythia. Um, this area that, uh, in fact, seemingly influenced a lot uh, this mm, northern Greek area in terms of of uh, of tactics, like um, the. We we don't actually t we will discuss it later. We d we don't know so much about which tactics were actually performed and how by these people. We, we don't we don't concretely know. Of course, there is this uh, thin red line in history between what is you know a, a good hypothesis, uh, actually a good theory, if it's substantiated by by facts, by evidence, but also the the actual truth that is something different because we can't see we weren't there so also many of the uh, accounts that we start having in the, especially in this Hellenistic period about military matters are paradoxically uh, inferior in quality uh, 
to and also in quantity telling the truth uh, by uh, depending on the standards of what we are actually discussing on on the on actual combat right uh, classical Greece produced much more details about warfare we we know actually classical warfare much better than we we do uh, in in the Hellenistic times and the Thessalians were definitely this protagonists among Hellenistic cavalry of the, within the Alexandrine uh, traditions and yet we know that there were certain influences that came from the north uh, from uh, the, the the Nubian um, valley and beyond in the north towards um, Scythia as a matter of fact and um, that were influenced actually by the steppes there were even uh, horse archers among the uh, the Danubian Thracians for example they were just next door to, to, to Macedon by uh, I mean the Thracians as a whole people uh, of course, you know, you could find easily horse archers actually in every single ancient cavalry of every given people because that's what people do. You know, if you can use a bow, which is one of the most ancient weapons in absolute terms, you can go on horseback, you know. There will always be in any army a horse archer. It doesn't matter that it's not from the steppes, it doesn't matter that it doesn't use this en masse, it doesn't matter that collectively speaking doesn't have a uh, much of a training that regard in for horse archery tactics. But you you can find it, but still these influences are penetrating from from this kind of more tumultuous, by the way, north because it is going towards the north. Thessaly was kind of advanced, of course, in comparison, but you know the the, the limit with the tribes of the Balkanic interland wasn't wasn't that even well defined at uh, certain points. Um, and uh, in fact, the same um, uh, Thessaly, just like Macedon. Uh, had this, yeah, very strong um, cavalry ethos, we can say, in its military culture, um, but uh, the, the unity of this land was actually pretty, pretty poor. They, these people, the, the nobility was quite, uh, it was usually divided, um, and um, th there was this post of Tagus that was the elected ruler and military commander of all Thessaly, that was recognized um, and, uh, and and under a strong Tagus, uh, Thessaly dominated the Perioikoi, you know, the, those mm, strange, uh, let's say, um, hill peoples basically living around the Thessalian plain, right? So, uh, once again, with, as it often happens in agricultural societies, this, this surplus coming from the fertile flatland that is able to produce enough power to subdue sub surrounding populations but this post of Tagus was very often vacant and therefore the nobility took, took over as it was normal um, and cavalry in Thessalian, in Thessalian army was uh, was definitely present in large numbers uh, Jason of uh, Ferai that was Tagus in the uh, 70s of the 4th century estimated that he could rise 6,000 cavalry, right? Over, um, over 10,000 hoplites and uh, many perioikic peltasts. This is important because uh, it's actually an enormous proportion of cavalry over, um, over the hoplitic infantry that, of course, existed in the cities from the cities of uh, Thessaly and that, uh, however, seems to have had a dramatically low in import you know having 6,000 cavalry and 10,000 hoplites right given that of course there is this other many uh, peltasts that are usually foot infantry but uh, many of them presumably as you know from these periokoi communities were also mounted right um, speaks for a dramatically chivalric military culture right the uh, the pamphlet here, Isocrates, estimates uh, Thessalian cavalry strength at over 3,000 in these times, right? Um, that is perhaps more realistic, but uh, with ancient sources it's not much about the, the, the actual um, plausibility of, of the number, rather the, the proportions that we have between the various arms that is quite meaningful and in fact mirrors this um, equestrian prevalence. Um, Jason's successors could not keep power, and in the 60s, uh, Thebes intervened um, in Thessaly, uh, 
uh, reorganizing it into a league of cities, right? And it's at this point that Philip II of Macedon was called in help to Thessaly against uh, Phocas, actually, um, and was elected Tagus of Thessaly himself. Uh, at this point, he restored the older organization of um, that was based on four provinces known as the Tetrarchiae, so the, the four you know centers of power through, and um, and 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 this was aimed to actually give back to the aristocrats p proper more influence which which is important because probably uh, he actually needed um, those elements that were the, the feudal one right that they weren't the, the commoners they weren't those that preferably would find on on, on foot um, the same Philip uh, boat a needed uh, Thessalian cavalry and, and horses and we will see later also the episode of Bucephalus that was a Thessalian horse and that's that's the point I was making before um, and how important that this is at this moment and the access to these resources is very important in ancient warfare you know that we will have to make a video at one point on the military reforms of Philip II that are the ones that effectively enabled uh, his son to conquer the known world at the time if it hadn't been for his father Alexander would have not passed into history as the greatest commander of all times um, and it, it started from from this thorough reorganization of the army that gravitated uh, around a uh, you know hammer and anvil tactics you know here we uh, for whoever is acquainted to these topics we you know what we're talking about the heavy shock cavalry and the Macedonian phalanx um, and when it comes to these topics, you 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 can find plenty of stuff on the internet of all kind. And uh, for the non-interested, like like kind of at an amaterial level, it can be difficult sometimes to frame correctly certain informations because everybody can find this information. The point is being critically able to 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 frame it in a realistic and historically uh, accurate, but also military logical frame. Um, and surely cavalry was of dramatic importance uh, also for you know fighting against other mounted people such as the Thracians it's the Thracian mines that will give the um, financial support essentially to to the construction of the Macedonian military um, uh, uh, under Philip II and Alexander III um, and, and therefore the aristocratic element here was um, was also, you know, also Macedon had this mm, radically aristocratic character, right? Probably even more than Tesla. I don't want to go as far as that, but, you know, um, it, it, it's a real thing here. And it was also a political thing, as always, before the military, military strictly speaking. Uh, but it, these guys could provide uh, the, uh, the the finest cavalry of the region, of the province, Albeit cities still seem to have re remained important in raising troops at the time. Um, the Salian cavalry fought for Philip against Phocas and in 341 in Thrace. Um, Alexander, that was mm, successor as a Thessalian, uh, the Thessalian Tagus, uh, as we know would take Asia with 800,000 Thessalian cavalry. Um, in um, Eli, we will see the organization a bit later in detail of unequal size, but this is of relative importance. Um, and it seems that the one from the cities of, of Pharsalus, the one where eventually 300 years later did the battle between Caesar and Pompey would have been fought, um, seem to have been the largest and the best contingent of all the cities. Now, the fact that there were the, that, that these were mm, largely aristocratic societies doesn't mean, in fact, that there weren't cities. That this is something we often forget. That you don't, you know, if you have a city, you don't necessarily have um, a democratic um, institute. You know, like government. You 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 have essentially oligarchy. Uh, which is probably always the best term to, to define it ever. 
um, you can't see it easily, I don't know, in Rome. Rome has never been, yeah, it was a republic technically, but what does a republic mean? It, the, the, the concept is much more shady. It was always an oligarchy, always, at, at all times, eventually turning into a monarchy with with a principate. But the the concept, the factor, because this is what it is, aside from the uh, formal uh, you know, uh, institutions, names and ideals, but uh, reality is, is this one. So actually, as in, in other cities, for, for example, the same Italy had in Capua some very good noble cavalry that uh, was wiped out eventually after the Second Punic War, but just for saying that a city doesn't necessarily mean poor cavalry. On, on the contrary, some of the finest cavalry, if you're going to the Seleucid uh, army playlist, you can actually find something uh, this about the types of cavalry, especially in the late Seleucid times, uh, when much of the territories of the empire had been lost, uh, cities of Syria and uh, you know the neighboring uh, areas were would be dramatic of dramatic importance in, in providing cavalry, heavy cavalry, right? And here the, the thing is a bit different in the sense that probably this was a bit more of a actually rural area than, of course, the cities of Syria were larger, and therefore the the, the actual, I mean, I'm trying to make a distinction on the base of what, um, you know, there are different types of cavalry. The, what we are talking about today in the case of Thessaly as well as, as Macedon are actually very good um, trained and collectively trained cavalry so of a culture that is really feudal, right? Other, heavy, even heavy cavalry of so these other other words would be internationally li- less, you know, capable of performing, like being very, very well armored, and actually knowing your business in 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 the field is 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 something different, right? And there there is this line always thinking that. Um, you you rarely that voice on a field is rarely kind of incompetent as an individual at least you know they never go nobody actually goes to battle without being particularly fit for it in, in general and even Voluses because of you know poor organization or whatever is actually still a functional thing on the field you know if you can man a, a, an army that's that's essentially what what you need you need troops you need specialists. You need someone who knows it, its deal in command. So we don't have to be so sharp and radical in separating these two types, but just know that they existed. And in this Thessalian cavalry was mostly in the first kind of more rural and aristocratic mindset uh, frame. Most of Thessaly would join the Hellenic revolt against the Macedons in 321 BC, but essentially thereafter it remained subject to the Macedonian kings right, and kept providing cavalry till uh, 196 when Rome actually um, freed part of it and gave uh, the rest to to Aetolia, right? Um and Thessalian infantry is actually rarely mentioned this is also something you get historically speaking when you when you are actually trying to substantiate certain the, the the world picture of troops we don't really know how the the uh, the, the armies as a whole were right in, in not even uh, do do you think that we actually know Alexandrian armies for example or that it, it's quite debatable it's it, the, you we rarely have a clear definitive picture that there are lots of numbers of uh, very often much later sources that are somewhat uh, ideal or however far from the events. Mm, etc. Um, the the as we know, we think actually that the Thessalians also made use of um, you know that they were actually mercenaries in, in great numbers. We know, for example, that um, the after the the conquest of Asia, actually, um, the the same part of the same Thessalians that had joined Alexander's ranks were disbanded and reenlisted as mercenaries. As to say, you know, yeah, we, we once belonged to someone in terms of clientels, etc. Back then in Thessaly, but th- this thing now is too is is too big, and we we simply hire to um, we get hired to follow Alexander and see what happens, and uh, he will recompense us in some way. Another very important city in Thessaly for horse breeding was Larissa. Was also the 
uh, kind of the southern border of, of Macedon, uh, the Macedonian dominations at least at that point at the time of Philip the second etc so um this was an area was progressively incorporated in in uh, in mass uh, under Macedonian uh, control and the uh, and eventually the Antigo in the Antigonid army in fact we know for example that the um cavalry force available to King Philip the the, uh, the fifth of the Antigonid uh, Antigonid Macedon at the Battle of Cunus Cephalae numbered 2000 at least according to Levy um, uh, 33 4.4 to, to 5 um, and this included uh, the Thessalian cavalry commanded by Heraclitus of Girton all right so um, the w talking about the actual cavalrymen because maybe we will see more in detail the Thessalian military organization on another on another occasion um, and talking about this cavalry in general b before uh, think about the, the organization only well uh, typically um, the cavalry also in Alexandrian armies in general uh, was composed by these uh, ile, uh, Eli uh, plural uh, which means squadrons, right, of 200 men, right, and subdivided into four tetrarchies, right, this is the typical kind of company uh, size um, element that, yeah, in kind of inorganics we call it squadrons, I believe, in general, uh, you can start talking about regiments of cavalry, um, just the others, the lower are usually called squadrons without much of a hierarchy, I don't know how to define this better, but uh, it's typical that this in turn is split into smaller units that have probably much more, uh, you know, a great tactical flexibility as such, always bearing in mind that the you, the cohesion of the ranks is, is important as a whole in, in mass, especially during a charge, a cavalry charge, and this is also what the the signs were seemingly kind of the best at, uh, at doing conceptually, but not only. There were many, many types, right? Um, it's just that cavalry has this chiefly offensive role, so that's what, at the end of the day, uh, it's epitomized by the, a great cavalry charge. Um, and a num um, let's say a number of Eli, usually two, uh, two or three or four, could f f uh, form into a cavalry brigade known as the Hipparchy, commanded by uh, Hipparch, right? And um, and the the actual number of squadrons per brigade was naturally variable in Hellenistic armies. Um, albeit later on, probably became somewhat more standardized, right? Um, and it, it naturally, cavalry, as as we were saying before, was segmented. Uh, in a certain way, but uh, especially the shock element that was somewhat more elitary by, by its nature um, entailed some field aids, like each cavalryman was allowed a groom who uh, might have been mounted as well, right? So even th the rest of lighter cavalry that you find as, I don't know, um, skirmishers or even horse archers or whatever, but also just other troops that were launched, I don't know, to, to pursue the enemy, typical role of the throwaway cheap light cavalry, um, etc. Uh, what was there, it, it could be composed by the social segmentation. Um, the, um, in fact, the grooms were usually, uh, yeah, first of all, their role was, as we know, they were like squires, they, they had to look after the horse and the equipment of the cavalryman proper, but uh, there were also the grooms were stationed behind the squadron in battle, usually, so that they could, of course, support their masters, but also act in certain cases in maybe dif different tactical roles detached from from their masters. And and never underestimate the small uh, unit tactics that are mm, some something we we don't reflect much on because objectively they're not documented at this time especially and then the the greater attention of sources in the ancient medieval world is towards the the the, the broader 
company uh, company size units like those who effectively made the, the difference on the field because they were you know the, the large more effective tactical bodies that were actually commanded by an officer was within the unit um, uh, differently from from uh, higher uh, commands well it, it depends of course but you know who commands a company sized unit it actually knows what the unit works like because he knows and that, that that's how we we structured this as as humans the, in terms of military hierarchy because um the, the company is th that unit the size of which you allows you to actually know um within the possible every every individual every man that is fighting there and therefore you know where you can um, send him in d during the battle, during combat, because also you are there as a commanding officer, and th that is very important because uh, you know that these people are who are make, gonna make th th the larger difference uh, on the field. Um, the uh, the so the cavalrymen owned their horses normally. Um, Although it, it was customary for a man drafted into the cavalry to be granted an initial sum to enable him to buy a mount of suitable quality. Naturally, this happened when the the, the levy was mostly for the levies that didn't quite um, you know that that literally didn't own a horse and they they needed the money to buy one in that specific context. But of course, you uh, the, the pay arrived also to to the to the vassals, let's say, to to the the higher nobles that actually owned already a freaking lot of of horses and of land, of course, and um, but that were paid as a military service, right? Professionalism is what is was what kicks in, and that ob objectively this st starts distinguishing, of course, gradually um, classical warfare from Hellenistic warfare, right? Uh, even though naturally late classical warfare is technically speaking already into professionalism and that's what will make it transition to but the, the Macedonian armies are the ones that for the first time um, are kind of fully professional because Macedon starts having enough money to be able to to, to maintain a permanent um, equipment training supplying system uh, even to have uh, an actual ar artillery park, for example, that other mm, peoples out there in, in in Greece, I'm talking about Greece, and the other civilized peoples um, had uh, and never had. I mean, in Greece specifically, of course, the, the, the Persians, for example, had had. But those were a freaking enormous empire. Well, Macedon here becomes something um, different from the other Greeks and, and takes over the Achaemenid Empire. And um, the uh, tanks to, to its military uh, at this point as well, with with an army that was evidently a com a com of comparable effectiveness, if some say superior, actually because they won. Yes, but as we always know, this is not about the actual tactical difference. You know, even if you look at the Battle of Gaugamel, but it was a freaking mess, right, from both sides. The, the, the Persians had basically arrived to the Macedonian camp and were looting it, so it's not really a good situation. But the Achaemenid Empire was uh, kind of a crumbling progressively, that was weaker politically, right? It was also not uh, much... One of the few situations where... In, uh, two great generals haven't met, haven't fought, haven't ch uh, challenged each other. Um, but it, what I'm trying to say here is it's an imminently political problem. right? When you look at military outcomes and say, oh, this is because they had the better army, the worse army, it's not really about that. It's about the the political side of the story first. From that, of course, follows the military one as well. And, of course, if an army is better than another, well, there are more chances of success, but th that's not how it works uh, all the times, right? And that's what we make a von Clausewitz mm, series for. Um, and uh, horses, horses were dramatically expensive, as you can imagine. Uh, even in the ancient world, were, uh, on average, especially in, uh, let's say, this was a kind of a feudal context, so of course so horses on, our, on average costed more than other places in Europe. Um, 
and those who were lost in action were replaced from the pool of remounts. Um, a system that at least in Macedon was run by the secretary for cavalry, hmm? and uh, this guy had pretty tough job because uh, a lot of horses died in battle. Right? Uh, think about I don't know. Um, even in an age before horseshoes, right? There were he, the hippo sun, uh, sandals that were called uh, that rendered the horses kind of less stable, etc. But it also uh, made them more vulnerable. For example, by a long march, right? Um, the horse, by the way, is an extremely resilient animal, but it can be crippled that extremely easily. And uh, at the Battle of Gaugamela, as you know, where also the Thessalians participated, um, importantly, as they, as we'll see later, they would close the battle on the left um, with their charge. Um, of 7,000 uh, horses, uh, 1,000 were lost. So just imagine all those owners who said, you know, my horse died, <laughs> like I need money, I need this. And these were big expenses. You, you don't have to underestimate it. And... You need your soldiers to, to be happy and to be satisfied with what is going on. You can't leave them on foot, especially if they are, if they have status and they have a name and clientele and part of the rest of the army is, is there just for, because, thanks to them, let's say. And in fact, in, on that occasion, for, think that the, the companion cavalry uh, at Gaugamel, I mean, lost uh, one-third of their horses. Hmm? Um... In, the commandeering was used to obtain remounts locally, albeit more usually it was the duty of provincial governors to produce horses and send them to the remount pool. Right? Uh, many cities or provinces paid uh, tribute on the hoof, um, and in the last resort, recourse had to be made to sequestration. Uh, of surplus mounts within the army itself. Think about the, the really the organizational problems, and this tells you why uh, maybe Thessaly and Macedon had actually equal, equally good cavalry, right? But Macedon had a kingdom that evolved into something very different from Thessaly, and hence uh, even the the effectiveness of these troops on the battlefield and the, the amounts of them and how they could be supplied and whatever depended, you know increased naturally its importance um, and the, the importance of the Macedonian cavalry specifically now about cavalry tactics so mm, cavalry tac the, the, in, in general at the time the, the cavalry formations that developed in, in the early 4th century allowed cavalry squadrons to redeploy rapidly and to reorient the axis of their attack, um, th giving them naturally flexibility. And as we know, Alexander's battle tactics ex exploited this cavalry flexibility, right? And the, um, the, the, the there was all this. For example, Alexander aimed to advance his army obliquely, so as to cause dislocations in the Persian line, as it attempted to outflank him on the right. Right when the, the Persian cavalry column attempting to turn his right flank would be kept at bay by successive charges of his light cavalry, right, delivered squadron by squadron, so charge after charge. Actually, cavalry tactics is quite complicated to 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 achieve, right? If you you don't have to look at video games and thinking you can deploy a unit whatever you you want on a field. Um, normally, you know, it's good the, the first one, you d deploy a unit you send it in combat and, and that's it, you know, and what, what emerges from that struggle, of course, there are several uh, charges in the meanwhile but the, the unity of the formation, like, remains more or less the same. There are uh, armies that are ca the units that are capable in the ancient world to perform this uh, three major attacks Right, it's the case, for example, of Numidian cavalry at the Battle of Cannae against the Romans. That is an extraordinary, a hell of a, uh, of, of a cavalry uh, ability that entails that these units had to basically reform during battle, 
uh, to launch this charge orderly because you know if, if there is order there is not order order in a charge you you can keep it but especially in a moment in history which it's really infantry that has the the upper hand as most time most times in history um, and this speaks for for the difficulties that these formations and these tactics entail. Um, as the Persians cavalry was forced to move further to the right, the, the Macedonian uh, they they would actually um, the, the Persian cavalry would eventually lose contact with their main battle line, and as soon as this location was observed in the Persian battle line, Alexander personally led his heavy cavalry straight for it. This is a kind of a stereotypical way of what what uh, tactical solution and employment of cavalry uh, entailed. Um, and Thessalian cavalry was a protagonist of battles of uh, Granicus under Permenian, for example. Um, at Battle of Gaugamela as well, uh, Permenian led this final charge on the left, uh, half there having in fact regrouped because it um, uh, after the, the mass that had uh, happened before, uh, at the Battle of Issus, for example, Parmenian, always on the left, was attacked and pushed back by heavy Persian cavalry. Right. So, um, and the and all this was done by t the Thessalians. Right. These were all episodes of actual uh, Thessalian, and and the, the, that's very important. The the right, as you know, especially in Greek armies, the Greeks had. Um, by tradition, that for reasons we can't explain now, it had to do mainly with the infantry, a predilection that they had an asymmetrical f deployment. Usually the right was heavier than the left, right? But the left was equally important because while the, the right, as we have seen now, was more like the spearhead, the left had to contain. So this action of containment was um, was per particularly um, um, it was it could be carried out only if you had a, a flexible cavalry that could attack and retreat and reform and launch another attack. And this is very difficult to do. But probably the, the most famous um, uh, Thessalian tactic is the famous um, rhombus, let's say, formation. Right? While the Thracians had the cuneus, um, uh, the wedge formation, um, that was a half of a rhombus at that point. The, the Thessalian one was was an, uh, a a rhombus, a full rhombus, let's say, and this was very very important because the rhombus can um, allow you to uh, change front not by th uh, ninety degree, but by just forty five degrees. So you advance with that, just knowing that you will have to attack in one direction or another at that point. And this allows. Uh, allowed effectively uh, not just the Thessalian cavalry but also the, the other Alexandrian ones that mutuated effectively these tactics, however, from the Thessalians to redeploy the direction of the attack. Now, this is very important. It sounds even kind of a uh, mechanicistic explanation that, as you know, I'm not a very, uh, I'm not a great fan of, and that's why I, you know, we, we have to be a bit skeptical on how these. Um, cavalry formations actually were, right? We don't have to think that, I don't know, that the Thessalians now were so special that they had found out this formation that nobody else had figured out. But definitely we, we can see behind these sayings that these types of cavalry had at least a very high level of collective training that allowed them to do things that evidently other cavalries weren't, not even the Macedonian ones apparently, originally were capable of doing. Right, so the Thessalians were uh, dramatically important in this regard, and they um, they seemingly schooled even the um, you know the 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 ones who introduced who participated on uh, mass in Macedonian armies as cavalry, and also bringing in this further uh, uh, ideas and uh, practices and know-how, right. Um, so, how would a typical um, Thessalian cavalryman be equipped? Like, it's different to it's difficult to differentiate them. Uh, as we were saying at the beginning of the video, we we drew this we drew this 
kind of stereotypical picture of the boy ocean element of the system and of uh, lack of armor. But the the situation was actually a bit more varied, right? Um, it seems that earlier Thessalian cavalry, uh, like between the 6th and the 5th century, in art, by the way, um, chiefly, that we get that from those sources, were unarmored, right? This this is typical, really. The cavalries of the ancient world, will, will, just like the infantry, were largely unarmored, right? Um, even in the phalanxes, etc., normally it was the, the first ranks who we were the toughest, we had enough equipment, of course. There were always lots of people who gravitated, maybe not within the same phalanx, but as skirmishers and supporters that uh, are deeply overlooked in uh, Hellenic classical warfare uh, because the Greeks tended to um, to stigmatize these elements of the army as kind of non-Greeks uh, in the sense that the true Greek was this citizen um, um, soldier, let's say, or, uh, that had to that was actually an amateur of war, like just Sparta had a actually somewhat professional way of. Uh, that compared to what the other tribesmen of the ancient world did was technically nothing uh, dramatic. Like, in, individually speaking, it's not that a trash, uh, an average Spartan was, I don't know, individually better than, I don't know, a Thracian warrior or uh, an Italic warrior or a Germanic warrior. Um, the Spartans combined a, a substantially greater individual training for example, the Spartans were the, uh, the the only Greeks that were actually taught to uh, they were actually trained for fighting with a sword. Like, of course, or the other Greek hoplites would have swords, and probably, especially at the beginning, you knew how to use them effectively. But the Spartans are those who maintained the idea that they had to train for all their lives. Well, the other Greeks, well, so so they did they did such things in times of festivals and whatever. But always bear this in mind, that Hellenic classical warfare is amateurial by definition. And this is what defines it, right? We, the usual exception of the Spartans, that confirms the rule, though. And that's where the Spartans were dramatically effective, though, because they, they trained collectively, uh, with, because they had a social, political social structure that, uh, contrary to, uh, to tribes, for example, that were superior to them individually, didn't have collectively, and that's what made the difference, and that's also why this long training made them better than the other Greeks, because the other Greeks didn't train all their lives, right? But I don't know why we came to talk about the Spartans now, I, I just um, I just wanted to say that, yeah, there were all these elements in the army which kind of light, light their, light their troops, that the Greeks um, saw like more like... A we, you can't talk about specialists in the true meaning of the word, but, I mean, if you're a peltist, for example, well, who are the peltists in, in, in an Hellenic mindset? Well, of course, it's those bar Thracian barbarians, right? Those are the good ones. Uh, who are the cavalrymen? Ah, the, the cavalrymen especially, you know, were the, the old, the aristocrats, the, the ones against the, the polis had fought for creating their democratic process. Actually, even if, especially in these cities of the north, the aristocratic element had remained. You know, when you think about this classical mindset, we're talking chiefly about Athens and Sparta because the others were already, by those standards, uh, by their standards, something something different, something at the outskirts, right, of this world. And we have seen, in fact, uh, in, in the case of Thessaly, that it was plenty of peltists, for example, that normally, you know, in Hellenistic warfare, in, excuse me, in, uh, well, okay, we were talking chiefly about the 4th century, so there were lots of peltists, of course, even, I don't know, in Athenian armies, and mm, Spartan armies, but not so many as they were indicated in here, and also what, so many cavalry, right, uh, as in se here, it's present here in Thessaly. But actually, we think that even in the, in the Hellenic classical warfare, there were plenty of other troops scattered around. Big digression, maybe it didn't have anything to do with this, but just for saying that it was normal at the time to find lots of people unarmored, right? Uh, the 6th century BC, the 5th century BC, we're talking about pretty damn primitive times, right? Never underestimate that uh, at that time. Resources, wealth, is something important. And Greece, objectively, is, is rising very fast. Um, so that you 
assist to a progressive transformation even of the Thessalian cavalry. The initial typical equipment would be the petasus, this was broadly um, I don't know how you say that, uh, hat and javelins, and that's pretty much it, right? Not much, not very differently actually from other types of cavalry, like the same Athenian light horse, and and but after the mid fourth century, these representations for the Salian horsemen cease and are replaced by helmeted men, right? Of 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 whom those few who are depicted clearly enough for us to be sure are wearing armor indistinguishable actually from that of other Hellenic or Macedonian cavalry. This is very important because this seems that in in the late fifth and in fourth century, um, Thessaly seems to have become markedly wealthier, right? And um, that's how fast it could happen. Certain regions of uh, the world, Greece in general, at this time was rocketing, as you know. Um, so um, this explains in part not the fact that, of course, you know. The, the, Tessalian cavalry men didn't use armor before, of course they used it, but just that, that it was more rare, right? Um, here, there is an increased segmentation, and this is particularly important. Um, there is, for example, a relief from the Tessalian city of Pelina, right, um, from the mid 14th, uh, 4th century, that shows a bronze cuirass reaching only to the waist, with shoulder straps and pterugas, that are just kind of decorations um, and the and, and there are of course different types even actually muscled coiras um, that were su suitable for cavalry Do we, we have this sense in the same when uh, there's a m muscled coiras or kind of plate even uh, armor etc to say oh, it's too heavy it's too impractical well actually not well of course it depends what, what you have to do probably uh, you know the uh, the the at the time actually the, there is this type was successfully a short waisted one actually it became standard for Hellenistic armor to cavalry as muscled muscled couriers um, and the the helmet in the and and the, there is actually nothing wrong with that there are worse things that can't help and after all that's a type of armor that at the time could be you know, pierced just by a uh, you know uh, a siege weapon. <laughs> there aren't many other things that can crush an armor at the time, right? So never underestimate this. That what you wear is can be un uncomfortable, bad, whatever. But if it protects you, well, the better it is. So also this greater skepticism towards, like the fact that maybe. Yeah, many people believe that, I don't know, leather armor was so widespread, right? But it actually wasn't, because um, aside from the fact that it's not necessarily so cheaper uh, as one thinks, and uh, effectively so, so, in fact, so effective, there are different solutions that either, um, you know, d to, to that, right? So not, uh, the, the, the idea of discomfort is valid up to a, to a certain point when you're actually risking your life out there, right? Um, then there is just this typical Thracian, uh, let's say this helmet which has a typical Thracian skull with attic style cheek pieces though, and forehead plate, right? And But more iconically, I think, as we were saying before, is the Boeotian style. Um, that became commonest for cavalry uh, in, in Thessaly and not only, right? Sometimes you see, even in art, it's difficult to distinguish, I mean, in modern art, between uh, a, a companion, a Macedonian companion and a Thessalian cavalry, man, because sometimes they're kept in kind of the same way, right? If you if you take out the fact that, yeah, normally companions are more elite cavalry than these guys were, which is it, uh, true up to a certain point, because of course the companion were the elites, uh, the elite, and they had better equipment, but, you know, the Thessalians had their, their own uh, as well, so even if, of course, this in the field, the Salian cavalry was kind of lighter in Macedonian armies because they were not the actual establishment, they were just lighter, me medium troops, but they were actually issued with armor. This is, 
often um, forgotten that the Ipes, the Salikoi, were tongue a issued, even in later times, to wear armor in, in the Hellenistic armies, at, at least some of them, and we know that, uh, therefore, those made the, the equivalent of what even a companion cavalry could be, in terms of, of equipment, at least. Um, so, mm, for example, the, the Boeotian-style helmets are pretty widespread for real, and uh, the, the Pelina um, representations actually sh uh, show it worn in Thessaly for hoplites, too. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I think, important. Probably Thessaly was also a country where there wasn't such a dramatic, a, d a dramatically sharp differentiation between infantry and cavalry. I mean, m many cavalrymen could even dismount and fight as infantry. Maybe not just in the phalanx like hoplites, but hey, come on, you know, everything is open to, like... Um, there are many variants as well. There is the, um, the certain variants from the coins of Scotusa, for example, with a boy ocean helmet with chick pieces, we don't find it extremely often. Objectively, even in, in modern representations, mm. tend to stereotype. Um, initially, the, the weapons of the Italian cavalry seem to have been the star standard Hellenic choice of javelins and spear. Theodorus uh, Siculus describes the Italian cavalry using javelins in 368 BC. Um, while um, coins show trusting spears used on their arm, which obviously means that uh, you know there were different types of cavalry, nothing nothing strange. So um, this shouldn't puzzle anyone, and and probably the same cavalry actually could both could do the both things if properly equipped, right? Uh, so mm, it's important to to realize that um, um, the by the four, in the fourth century, the Thessalian specifically and the Boeotian cavalries were regarded essentially as the best in Greece. Especially the Thessalians kept their reputation. Polybius in the second century um, said that they they were irresistible w when charging in formation. Um, though slow and awkward if they had to fight individually, which we we don't really know what it means because you know uh, yeah I, I I get it like uh, th there are probably certain units that are more effective for what they can give collectively and they're not meant to to fight just like a a single. Uh, in single common, especially if they're lighter on average, like we we often under underestimate, for example, the um, the actual impact that a cavalry charge has, even if they are kind of lighter troops. All right, we think uh, well, lighter troops is not cavalry charge has this dramatically shocking effect on everyone, and and at that point it, it also counts how good uh, such a good cavalryman you are. Right, you could have guys coming from, I don't know, certain wealthy cities of the most advanced areas in the world that could cover themselves all in iron and being so, you know, uh, well equipped, but if you, they can't have a collective training because they're just sit all the time in their houses and nothing else, because they're, they're not professionals, or at least they're, they have not ex much of a direct experience and whatever, collectively they're not a great match, and even a lighter cavalry can out maneuver them can uh, put them in conditions of being, you know, defeated quite easily, uh, even if they don't have the, the same amount of equipment. Um, so, naturally, ancient authors sometimes say strange things, but we we don't mind. They they don't have to to make sense uh, all the time, right? They um, there is this sense that. Uh, you know, every quote from authors like Polybius and whatever have to be taken literally as truth. Like, it's not really so, not even contextually, right? Um, the same Polybius that is normally credited with this great, enormous experience. He was sent in Egypt as an advisor for the Ptolemaic, you know, Ptolemaic kings. He was Hipparchus and whatever. But we don't have to think these people were, uh, uh, were dramatically um, aware or experienced as we think or not we don't know what their sources were 
Um, but maybe we'll expand on, on these topics on another on another occasion. Um, there are other over time, especially by ocean. Um, reputation declined over time during the third century. Thessalian cavalry is part of essentially Antigonid, Antigonid mass, right? And uh, in Greece, actually, the best cavalry was um, the Aetolian one, or at least it was reputed so. Um, there were different um, other characteristics we could think of in equipment. Um, the it seems that it was Alexander that brought to a replacement of the Phrygian helmet with the Boeotian ones in his cavalry, at least, and we have seen the, the, what it was in common with with the Thessalians in this regard. And um, the um, there were many different, even s symbols of distinctions. Um, that now we can't skip. Maybe it's not that important in terms of actual armament, right? Um, you know the, the system, the cavalry spear. This was a, you know, strong cornel wood made lance, uh, albeit it often shattered I in action, right? And so it was fitted with a second spearhead at the butt to allow the trooper to continue fighting, which is particularly interesting. And uh, and the objective of the system, as such, was basically to point it at the enemy faces. Right, and that's why, and this starts to be a real. That's what you find in the Pontic era, even in the Achaemenid Empire. For example, facial masks worn. I made a video about the the Roman ones specifically, but you know, when you find that, you you usually think that there is a pretty much pretty intense equestrian warfare, whose objective is to aim directly at the face of the adversary, because that's what you do in, in a cavalry charge, a cavalry versus cavalry charge, especially, and. And naturally, also against horses, but naturally, if you knock out the the the, the cavalryman, is 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 better. And the there was a sword naturally as a secondary weapon that was slung after the left arm, uh, under the left arm, and the naturally equipment was not standardized uh, as such. Uh, standardization came from practice in the sense that you know certain things were more useful than others. But naturally, could everybody could buy if they had the, the money, wh whatever they wanted. And in, and as we have seen, the aristocratic troops who also had this personal mm, shield bearers, weapon bearers that uh, would enable them to to fight, even even on foot, actually, if necessary, because this could happen as well. After all, cavalry cannot defend by definition, so you you need to dismount in certain particularly difficult situations, and even. Um, you know, uh, Alexander's bodyguards were kind of commandos, like they, they could do many things, and it depends on. Uh, there was a lot of fluidity and flexibility in in, in the organic of, of these armies. You don't think how has, you know, standard tactically standardized troops that could do that and only that, especially. The, the the more you rose to the ranks, um, the the more you know the the aristocrat could do literally every freaking thing. And this is valid for the Salian elite uh, as well. Um, the 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 companion to Salian and allied cavalry were normally issued with cuirasses, as we have seen, and these cuirasses were made of small metal plates linked together, lined or covered with leather or linen which uh, added re resistance and flexibility and, and it's interesting because mm, albeit these were elite troops sometimes you could find even Alexander himself rarely wearing a cuirass now th this could be a sort of could be a problem of course uh, Alexander risked his life many many times um, and the young, this was typical of the youth, of the young nobles in the cavalry, especially among the companions. Um, so that the, the this was a, a way of bravery. It, it's it's typical feudal societies. You find it in medieval times as well, but not necessarily you know as a form of uh, you know that they were completely unarmored. Like I doubt that actually the companion cavalry was largely unarmored. I think. 
um, you, you, there, there is a limit to this in, in practicing in reality. But there would be many that would try this. Also because there would always be um, uh, is a, a need to have kind of lighter troops and uh, in this broader units and corpses that um, needed to be more uh, flexible and um, to support the the heavier troops with um, some sort of um, of lighter functions like of running even just to think about bringing messages and stuff you know um, we haven't talked about this a lot really but it would be too deep in this this topic um, and you can think of boats that were pretty much standard at this point, actually. Um, and we, we can think of even of a certain degree of uniformation of, of colors at a regimental level, uh, or even squadron color, for example. Um, the But it's just like uh, an hypothesis we, we don't have. But, uh, we, we often underestimate how... Maybe colors were more uniform than we think, while um, while armor actually, like equipment actually wasn't right. Or at least this is a problem. We also, we haven't investigated thoroughly, and that we we should. I, I made a video actually about the colors in the Rome Imperial Roman Army, something like that. Uh, but it was just an intro, and I will have to to write actually a lot more. Um, about about this, um, there is a passage from from Courtesis that is quite stereotypical, but it gives you the idea of maybe how certain troops were perceived. Um, while, for example, at the Battle of Issus, when uh, the, there is this massive Persian cavalry column charged uh, charging the Thessalian cavalry, right? And Courtesis writes. But on the right, the Persians were strongly attacking the Thessalian horsemen, and already one squadron had been ridden down by their very onset, when the Thessalians, smartly wheeling their horses about, slipped aside, and returning to the fray with great slaughter, overthrew the barbarians, whom confidence in their victory has scattered and thrown into disorder. Right. Um, this is an interesting passage because it shows a bit what we were telling about before the the rhombus flexibility. Um, the the role of the sun in cavalry w was important also in other um, in other contexts of, of ancient warfare. Um, also against in uh, the for example we we've seen Issus. But think about the Thessalians that figure at the Battle of Heraclea in 280 BC against the Romans. Actually, Pyrrhus uh, launched these, uh, his Thessalian cavalry um, when the Roman line was wavering and completed their the Roman route, right? And it has this particular um, yeah, importance. At Issus, we, we just said at one point that the Thessalians countercharged um, and um, the um, the, 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 the there was this heavy um, indecisive fighting uh, followed uh, following that um, mostly came to an end when the Persians saw that their mercenaries had been beaten at that point and they, they retreated and the Thessalians pursued them um, so these guys weren't obviously superheroes like no no unit historically speaking is but they they are pretty damn resilient and also very good at uh, very flexible on, on the field particularly um th there is indication in general that as actual horsemen uh aside from the 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 equipment as right as actual caval um like equestrian abilities the Thessalians were the best unit in the Macedonian army Right, um, the they they well deservedly uh, had the reputation of the finest horsemen in the Atlantic world, right? Um, and that's why um, the and this is interesting because th there was naturally a challenge that the Thessalian uh, elite posed to the same Macedonian ones, and that's why Alexander, for political 
and social reasons had to maintain a said prestige of his companions is even as cavalrymen by, by um, not just deploying the Thessalians regularly as we've seen on the left wing that however was a very important position and also you know one that required this tribute of blood right um, but also probably equipping them in a kind of a worse way like at least the best armored base the best resources in terms of training even the best horses right maybe even to silent horses were given preferably first to to uh, to the companions and, and uh, the thyroid as they were called and not to the Thessalians right and um, we have seen before Diodorus that talks about this 1800 Thessalians moving in Asia um, into Asia together with Alexander um, and we can assume that they were organized actually in a similar fashion than the companion cavalry was hmm? um, the we have seen before also importance of the city of Pharsalus that constituted at that point the vanguard squadron of the uh, of the Thessalians making up Anila on its own that were the finest most numerous according to Arian um, and and Parmenius bodyguard actually was formed um, by Thessalians, right? That they, they weren't at that point just the left wing. They were also the actual escort for 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 Parmenian at Gaugamena. And in fact, this was a um, an equivalent uh, of the royal squadron of the companions, right? Was a this a properly Thessalian regiment that um, there was a double squ strength squadron of 400 by by analogy and in terms of composition we've seen that, that, that probably like we, we don't really know but that every ile corresponded to a city and probably uh, there were troops raised from Larissa, from Ferrai, um, Tricca, Farcadon, Polina, Olozon and Philippi slash Philippopolis it was the ancient Gomphi. Um we know that 200 Thessalian uh, horsemen joined the, ar uh, the Macedonian army at Gordium, but they were probably, um, you know, integrated in pre-existing Eli rather than uh, creating a, a new one, a ninth one from the eight that we we know that existed. There were eight technically, and eventually this Thessalian regiment was disbanded at uh, Ecbatana. Uh, where the the allied contingents were actually sent back to, to Greece and 130 volunteers stayed uh, with the army and um, and these Thessalian volunteers formed a small unit on their own they served another year against the, the person against Bessus as you know it was creating quite a problem um, in the mountains up there and um, they, they eventually were disbanded before the uh, crossing of the Oxus River though because there were too few and they suffered many losses at that point we think and uh, on the Alexander's sarcophagus we have two horsemen that one hunt and the other one is in battle and they they're interesting because they are wearing a distinctive Thessalian cloak that was this national dress of Thessaly, uh, identifiable by the two points hanging down both in the front and behind the figure. And the and and these were nicknamed, in fact, as the Thessalian wings in in, in Greek. Um, and these two horsemen are actually meant to depict pro actual. Thessalian cavalry, I mean, and, um, and I think a final mention can be done for uh, the most famous horse um, in in this context, that of course is the Thessalian Bucephalus, the ox head, literally me, and um, the, there is all the story, as you know, of the young Alexander taming this um, magnificent beast, and um, Alexander was no more than 10 or 11 years old when one day a Thessalian horse trader visited Pella uh, 
and uh, among his fine horses, he brought with him this large black stallion and that costed uh, 13 talents. That was pretty much, actually, a small fortune. And um, and there were people who were interested in buying him, uh, the horse, but um, they everybody who came close to him was... Uh, you know they couldn't couldn't um, ride him right because he would be very um, he reared up violently so it was actually even dangerous so it's at this point that allegedly Alexander um, pestered Phil his father to let him try to mount a horse and his father was annoyed but as you know with the request but uh, at the end he ended up in agreeing and Alexander had noticed that the horse was spooked when his shadow fell in front of him. So he calmed him by turning him to face to the sun so that his shadow fell behind him. Um, and this is a beautiful symbol because it's really the, the solar uh, in the European ideal of the horse as the uh, uranic and chthonic animal that is so like earthly and bloody but at the same time brings to to, to the heavens, to the skies, to, to the sun, right? The also will the symbolism of the eagles is is about the, the only uh, the only bird that can look straight at the sun. So so Bucephalus did um in in, in broader symbol th- this is what the story is meant to, to be. And at this point uh, Philip was moved because actually Alexander managed to jump on, on the horse and to r- r- and ride him off, right? And um, and this is where mm, mm, Philip actually bought Bucephalus for his son, and uh, predicting that Macedonia would never be big enough for someone like Alexander. And naturally, it's a l- legend that wants to depict Alexander the superhuman, even as a boy, right? And um, and the the adventures of Alexander and Bucephalus are very famous. Um, Alexander wrote it uh, up to 386, where he had died from the battle wounds re- suffered in uh, in India, and 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 you, w- you have to think of this Thessalian horse that naturally um, it, it's a bit unrealistic that this guy you know traded horses that could not calm this one down. So it's a bit, but it's the story fits in the broader mindset of the. Uh, of the equestrian culture of the Macedonian aristocracy, and these great horses were seen as the symbols of of great power, of great of virility, of masculinity, of strength, of military glory, of victory, and and what a better uh, context than uh, Alexander's um, life in in this regard. Um, but there was a very strong connection, a very strong bond between. Uh, horsemen and horse of course because you y- in battle you you can't be like a poor you you need to trust each other cent for cent and therefore you you can't be for example even a good horseman having a so-so horse or being a so-so horseman having a good horse it will not work you have to be a good horseman good horse um and establishing this relation that is based on literally on trust and, and the horses are terribly intelligent animals I and mean, it's incredible what they can do in fight they they're aggressive they can uh, kick and bite and and do uh, you know uh, throwing say uh, headshots um, and uh, whatever but this was just for um, for the record and okay we, we can stop it here um, I hope uh, that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.